I, uh, I am so embarrassed that I messed up the Lord's Prayer. Um, sometimes uh, in worship, I'm thinking about the next thing. And uh, uh, don't do that. Don't, if you ever get a chance to do this, don't do that. Um, that's not a good thing. And uh, Anyway, um, this morning, the, the message title is, That Won't Burn. As soon as I get this thing working. That Won't Burn. Uh, I want you to say to your neighbors, That Won't Burn. All right, we're going to say that a few times today. I told you uh, that over the next few weeks, I will, uh, week by week, uh, just kind of let you know kind of what I did on my sabbatical and, and things like that. Uh, again, if you weren't here last week, I am so grateful that our church, um, I, I can't believe that I got to do that. What, a, what an incredible gift to me um, and hopefully a gift to you as well. Um, and then, uh, uh, so what was I doing while I was on sabbatical? Um, well, I was writing and um, I am writing a book. The title of it is called Believe. And it's a book about the miracle of belief in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. And I'm using uh, the Gospel of John as a guide to look at the very particular thing Christians mean when they talk about belief in Jesus and what that means for the person who believes. And so um, this is uh, um, nerve-wracking for me to share that with you because that's sticking your neck out. So then someone's going to go, well, next week, do we get the book? What? What's the deal? Uh, we're a long way from that part, but I will tell you um, that while I was gone, I wrote 25,752 words, um, arranged them all on pages, um, 108 pages. About 10 chapters were finished. I have two more chapters to go. Um, and then a lot of work to make, just kind of make sure those chapters line up, uh, edit, edit them because, you know, uh, it should be in the same language all the way across and sh should be, you know, words should be spelled well and things like that. Um, and then we'll submit that, um, see what, see what happens from there. I would like, like it to at least be something that is a resource for our church because when our world talks about believing in Jesus, I think they mean something completely different than what, what the gospels are talking about. And so, um, now, this was hard to narrow down to one thing, and so um, the Lord just helped me um, do kind of an outline of a series of books. The next one that I would like to write will be Follow, and I will use the book of Matthew in the same way. Um, and then Kingdom it would be beyond that, what it means to be part of the kingdom of God, um, including part of the church and things like that. Uh, that will be um, both the Gospels and the book of Acts. And then surrender. How do, what, what does it mean to be totally surrendered to God? Holy. What is holiness? And, uh, and then we'll see what happens after that. Those seem like really big ambitions to me. But, uh, but we'll see. We'll see how that works out. It may be that this is my one and only attempt at this. I'm not sure. But be praying for me in the midst of all of that. So sound exciting? I don't know. I don't know if it sounds exciting or not. Some of you are looking at me like, he wrote something? <laughs> Noah Wiggler's over here thinking, I ain't reading it. <laughs> oh, shame on you. Shame. All right. Say it again. That won't burn. That won't burn. Last week we talked about Elijah. And uh, let's see if you remember a couple of things. Elijah told King Ahab that something's not going to happen for three years. What was that? It's not going to rain for three years, okay? Because King Ahab was following not after Yahweh, not after God. He was following after the Baals, which is a Mesopotamian god that, that is kind of all throughout that whole Canaanite area and that kind of thing. Um, and, uh, and so Ahab has turned his back on God, has started slaughtering the prophets of God. And in fact, Elijah's the only prophet. And God sends him to the Kareth Ravine to hide him, to keep him safe. He feeds him uh, with, uh, by ravens and he gives him water. How? With a 
brook. That's right. And so he is sustained for a while. He's kept safe for a while. But then all of a sudden, God says, I want you to go somewhere else. And to help him go somewhere else, what happened to the brook? It dried up. That's right. And so last week, we talk about, talked about what happens when God dries up our brook. He then goes on to where God has, has called him to go. And he helps uh, the, the widow at Zarephath. We're not given her name. We're just given her place. And helps her because she is about to starve to death in the midst of this famine. And uh, he helps her with, with food. God fills her jug of of oil and her jar of flour every day. She is fed by a miracle, her and her son. And then her son gets sick and dies, at which point you and I are going, what, what, what next? You know, this, this just seems to be the last domino. Uh, but Elijah prays for this young man and he is resurrected, right? So we talked about the difference between revival and resurrection. Revival is for the people who are following God to be renewed, to be strengthened so that something is made important again, so that, so that we are, are given new life again. Uh, resurrection is for those who are dead to God and who need to become alive to him. That's what the picture of salvation is. That's what the picture of baptism is. We die with Jesus and go under the water and then we are raised to new life in him. If you've been raised to new life, why don't you say amen this morning? Yes. Well, if you've said amen this morning, then you're a candidate for what? Revival. <laughs> because guess what? The enthusiasm, the excitement that we had, the passion uh, that we had at one time, that passionate part of our faith goes away every now and then. Now, here's what, here's what long-term Christians do when that happens. They just say, you know, it's all part of maturity. Because I'm more mature now that I am not as passionate about Jesus. And uh, I don't need that emotional stuff, right? Right? So look at the person next to you and say, you're full of it. Yeah, you're full of it. Because guess what? You do need that. God wants to engage you heart, soul, mind, and strength. Doesn't he this morning? He wants you to love him with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. He wants all of you this morning. And we assume that it's just natural. We assume that it's just part of growth and grace. We just keep on moving through the routine, moving through the motions. But what does it look like to bring that fire back? Because I believe God wants to bring the fire back. So, again today, I'm going to be preaching less than teaching. We're not going to get into all the histories behind things, although we really could in this passage. There are some great things going on here. Um, but... Be, that means also that you're participants this morning. You didn't just come to consume what we're doing here today. You're participants. So I expect to hear some amens. I expect to hear some clapping. And, uh, and even humor me by laughing at a few jokes. All right? You ready for that this morning? All right. But our goal today is to encounter God, the living God, in his word. And come, to, come face to face with him this morning. So would you stand for the reading of God's word? We're going to read in 1 Kings chapter 18. We're going to start with verse 16, all right? And Ahab, the king, went out to meet Elijah. So Elijah comes back into town because God has sent him now from Zarephath back to meet the king and to confront him one more, one more time. There's, there's a showdown that's going to happen here between, between Elijah and the prophets of Baal. When he saw Elijah to him, he said to him, now, if you're going to have like a put down of somebody and you're like a ruler, you need a better one than this. All right. I just want to hear, is that you, you troubler of Israel? He just couldn't think of anything better. He just couldn't. Now, David is a smart aleck, so he could think of a lot better things. Just right on his toes. He could come up with better stuff. Mic drop stuff, all right? Uh, but but are, is that you, you troubler of Israel? All right. And Elijah replies, I have not made trouble for Israel. Elijah replied, 
But you and your father's family have. You have abandoned the Lord's commands and have followed the Baals. Now, summon the people from all over Israel to meet me on Mount Carmel. So get all, the, all Israel together and bring the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. So somebody do the math real quick. 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of Asherah. How many of those prophets are there? 850, all right, <laughs> against Elijah. Okay, sounds fair to me. All right, so Ahab sent word throughout all Israel and assembled the prophets on Mount Carmel. And Elijah went before the people and said, this is an important line here. How long will you waver between two options? Look at the person next to you and say, how long? How long will you waver between two options? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. The people said nothing. It's a sad line. People said nothing. Then Elijah said to them, I am the only one of the Lord's prophets left. But Baal has 450 prophets. So... Get two bulls for us. Let Baal's prophets choose one for themselves. Let them cut it into pieces, put it on the wood, uh, but not set, it, set fire to it. I will prepare the other bull, put it on the wood, but not set fire to it. And then you call on the name of your God, and I will call on the name of the Lord. And the God who answers by fire, he is God. Then all the people said, what you say is good. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. All right. So we've got a showdown here. Um, a, a big fight. That's right. It's Clint Eastwood going on in the background here. You might think in the midst of a drought that the showdown between God and Baal would be a showdown of water. Let, let the God who brings water be our God. But no, this is a showdown of fire. Elijah's question of the Hebrew people is how long will you waver between two opinions? How long will you ride the fence? When will you choose? When will you get off center and either follow God or follow Baal? When will you be passionate with God? When will you approach him with fire? Remember, there are different elements that often become symbols uh, that, that mean different things for us. And we talked about this some weeks ago that fire can can mean one of three things. Fire can be the leadership of God, like God leading them at night in a pillar of fire out of Egypt, or the purifying presence of God, where God burns up the dross and, and, uh, and cleanses us. Or it can be what we're talking about today, the passion of the people of God. It's this fire that is the passion of the people of God. And the standard for this showdown is not the God who sends water. Here, it's the God who sends fire because before God will take care of their lack of water, he needs to take care of their lack of fire. Before they are ready for water, they need to encounter the God of fire. How about you this morning? You encountered the God of fire. Hey, our house, when we bought it, had this funky wire, uh, fireplace in it. Some of you saw it and laughed with us about it. Um, a fake fireplace. Now, fake fireplaces are all right. There's some really nice ones out there. In fact, we ended up buying one and, and put a new one in. And uh, But the one that we had when we got there was um, actually... A TV that was inserted up inside of the fireplace, the top part of the fireplace, and then it reflected down onto a glass and had some logs behind it. And what this TV did was it was connected to a VCR that played on loop a recorded fire. I know. You want to. Yeah. 
I don't know about you, but there is nothing inside of me that on a snowy night when we're all kind of in and we all want to pop some popcorn and we all just want to snuggle up around the fire, there is nothing inside of me that says, hey, turn on the recording of somebody else's fireplace. Does it to you? I mean, we even tried to do some mores over that thing, but, you know, it just didn't work. It didn't work. There's nothing like a roaring fire, right? Nothing like a roaring fire. However, um, uh, I do remember this, that when our kids were little, um, there was like over a holiday season or something like that. Um, in, in our house at that time, we did have a real fireplace. And, uh, and, and over the holiday season, the, there was just like, if, I don't know if they were up really late or what, but there was just like a fireplace on TV one time. And I remember them sitting there watching that. Ten minutes later, I came back in the room and there they are watching a fireplace, probably because it's on, you know. And I said, do you, do you kids want me to start a real fire in the fireplace? No, we're good with this. Okay, all right. I wonder how many of us enjoy the fake fire. I wonder how many of us like the recorded loop of somebody else's fire. You know, because that's clean. You don't make a mess with that fire. I mean, you, you just turn it on or turn it off. Or yank it out and throw it in the trash. Because that's what it needed to, be, needed to happen. It, it's easy to control. You know, real fires aren't that easy to control. I made a fire one time and we put too many logs in. And one of the logs fell out onto the floor, onto the carpet. That wasn't pretty. We had to put that out. But other than that, I love real fires. How about you? Well, I think... That there is a space inside all of us that desires passion. We deeply, deeply need and desire passion. And if we do not have a place to connect that desire, we will make up something to put in there. And many times we put something fake in place of the real thing. Fake fire. Many of us prefer fake fire. So we settle for and often just go with emotions. We'll live off somebody else's fire. Fake fire. The prophets of Baal are brought around and they're given a challenge. The God of fire, that will be our God. So here's the, here's the rest of this. This is so fun. I just love this passage of scripture. I, I hadn't really read 1 Kings for a while. And so I got back to reading 1 Kings. And I just thought, man, this Elijah is cool. He's just so cool. And uh, so here we, here we go. Elijah, uh, this is verse uh, 25. Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose one of the bulls and prepare it first. Since there are so many of you, okay? So we'll kick off to you first, you receive, and then we'll receive in the second half, all right? It's kind of home field advantage, and so that's the way we'll do it. Call on the name of your God, but do not light the fire. Don't go getting tricky on me. Don't you light this fire? So they took the bull, gave it, uh, uh, bull given to them, prepared it, and then they called on the name of Baal from morning till noon. Baal, answer us. They shouted, but there was no response. Listen to this. No one answered. And they danced around the altar that they had made. Now, this part's funny because we get into some biblical trash talk, okay? Any of you trash talkers out there? I mean, board games at our house are pretty interesting because I believe in trash talk. Uh, if, if you don't have trash talk during a board game, it's not really a board game, all right? If we're playing sorry together... We don't just do, you're out, okay, so, you know, oh, yeah, I'm sorry, we got to take you back to your home base. No, we do the atomic drop, and man, your piece, the shape of those pieces, they just go sideways, and you don't ever know, you'll find them under the couch someday or something like that. You just got, anybody else trash talkers here? Anybody? 
we got like five trash talkers here. I've heard you guys before. we got way more trash talkers than that, all right? Wake up the trash talker next to you, okay? Um, and so here's Elijah. Here's biblical trash talk going on here. At about noon, Elijah began to taunt them. Shout louder, he said. He's a hearing aid. Surely he is a god. Perhaps he's deep in thought. Or busy. Or traveling. This flight just didn't come in today. Maybe he's sleeping and must be awakened. Give it another shot. So they shouted louder. They slashed themselves with swords and spears, as was their custom, until their blood flowed. And then midday passed, and they continued their frantic prophesying until the time for the evening sacrifice. But there was no response. No one answered. No one paid attention. It seems ridiculous, doesn't it? We, we, we just look at them and go, geez, that was so long ago. And you know, we've progressed so much since then. These were primitive people, right? Just lean to the person next to you and say, they're primitive people. You're primitive too. Because we do this exact same thing, don't we? We do this exact same thing. But I'll go first. Let, let's just give some, some illustrations here. I'll go first. There are all kinds of things I'm passionate about. And one of them, and Sherry and I have had to talk about this, one of them is um, the next thing, the next deal. Anybody get passionate about the next deal? I mean, you're excited about what you're doing now, but you know what's coming next, don't you? Uh, my granddaughter is big on this. Of course, anything she does is the most exciting thing to be doing in the world at the time until she finds out there's something else to do. And then she's excited about that thing. Well, I've kind of been that way all of my life. And we've got pictures. We've got, I think, about nine or ten, and I'm, this is not an exaggeration, picture books of our life. And you know what is important about the picture book is every now and then you get to go through and look at the picture book. But what's most important about the picture book is the next picture book, what's, what's going to be in the next pictures. And so I, I brought a picture. It's of one of our grandchildren, a uh, baby picture. I didn't want to embarrass Noah on a bearskin rug or anything like that. We, we don't actually have that picture or, or anything. I brought a picture just to be reminded of the, of the fact that the, the next thing can be the exciting thing. That's what we're passionate about. Oh, you know, life will be so much better. Um, you know, I'm in, I'm in high school and, and, you know, this isn't real living. What's real living is when you graduate from high school. And then you graduate from high school and you go, you know, this, this isn't real, real living. I'm, when I get into college, that will be real living. And, and then we get into college and we find out that, man, college... It's just college. I mean, it's like high school on steroids. That's right. And we, we, we got a little more freedom, but it's just college. And the, what's real living and what's real exciting and what I can get really passionate about is that once I graduate from college, then I'll get my first job and uh, my first real job. And that will be what's exciting. And then we get into that real job and, and we kind of go... Maybe it's marriage. Maybe it's marriage next or something like that. We get married and we go, you know, that didn't seem to do it either. It's the next thing. Is anybody else here with me that you've always enjoyed the next thing? Yeah, yeah. Some of you are lying right now and some of you are, are all over that. I'm, I'm for the next thing. I'm always excited about the next thing. But guess what? Um, that won't burn. Look at the person person next to you and tell them that won't burn. No, oh, that was sloppy. Let me tell you why we're saying that this morning. When, when we were kids, um, probably in between um, second and third grade, I was over at my friend David's house. Now, I grew up in the suburbs of Denver, Colorado in Lakewood, all right? Woo, Lakewood. Uh, and, and we were at the foothills. Now, David's house was on a cul-de-sac. And in, behind his house was like this agricultural drainage ditch, okay? And it went 
a long way through town, and we'd float boats up and down that thing. We'd catch crawdads out of that thing. We'd throw each other in that thing. We'd jump over the thing. Anyway, it was kind of like our wildlife refuge. So we were in David's backyard, and we decided um, that, that we were going to be wilderness people, survivalists in the suburbs of Lakewood, Colorado, okay? As long as you can see 7-Eleven from here, you know, we can survive. And, and so we decided um, we're going to be survivalists. And so we, we went through the survival strategy. The first thing you got to do is shelter. So we drug all my friend's dad's tarps out of his garage, which he really appreciated because he needed to know where those were, and stretched them all across his yard and things like that. And then... Um, uh, the next thing we needed was water, so fortunately we found water because they had a hose right there, and so we brought the hose around, and so we had a road, we turn, turned that on so that we had running water, and then we decided we needed fire, right? Now, are there any smaller, smaller kids do not do what we were trying to do, although it won't work anyway, because uh, we decided because... We're survivalists. We're not going to use matches to light a fire. And so what we did was we got my friend's limb loppers, his dad's limb loppers, lopped a few limbs off of their bush and decided we're going to do this the old-fashioned way. And we started rubbing sticks together. Anybody else ever try this before? Yeah. So we had green wood and we had two sticks and we were rubbing them together. And of course, between the ages of second and third grade, you got a lot of energy. And so we're all just sitting there talking and we're just rubbing the sticks together and things like that. And what we didn't realize was that um, uh, his, my, my friend's dad showed up. And I, it's right. And I'm there working on this thing. And he was kind of a tall guy. He, um, he always drove um, either a Riviera, an old 60s version Riviera, like a low rider car. Or he had a chopper, a, you, you know what I'm talking not a helicopter, a motorcycle that had a chopped front end. So it had a really long spokes on the front end. You're, any, don't look at me like you're really old, all right? You all know what I'm talking about, okay? Um, anyway, and uh, some of you all wore corduroys to high school and you know it, all right? You zipped your way down the street, okay? And bell bottoms. Um, anyway, he had this this chopper, and so why we didn't hear him, I don't know, because that thing was really loud. But we were working on this thing, and I am there on the ground working, and all of a sudden I feel a shadow over me, and I look up, and he is standing right above me, and he didn't say, "What y'all doing? Why did you make a mess out of my lawn or anything like that?" He just looked down at that, and he said, "Well, that won't burn. That won't burn." And then he walked off as if to say, it's okay that you've torn my garage up today and you've got the backyard a mess, but <laughs> I feel pretty good because the house won't be on fire anytime soon. All right. All right. So that won't burn. Let's just tell you the next thing to be passionate about the next thing that won't burn. You know what happens when you're constantly passionate about the next thing? I mean, you can be excited about the next thing. Next thing is, is good many times. But you know what you miss out when you're just passionate about the next thing? The current thing. The current thing. That's one of the things that we have to tell Kenslin, my granddaughter, is, hey, I thought you were excited about sidewalk chalk. Yeah, I was until we made some marks, and then I found out there's water balloons, right? And so let's enjoy sidewalk chalk for a little while. Let's enjoy, let's enjoy high school for a little while. Let's enjoy college for a little while. Let's enjoy being married for a little while. Let's let, enjoy singleness for a while, okay? It's not always the next thing, the next thing, the next thing. Um, let's see, what else do we have? Oh, for parents with kids. Parents with kids, you're going you're gonna to love this. How about this? Children's athletics. Um, mine, uh, I coached uh, basketball, uh, soccer, football, wrestling. Um, I wish Sherry was here today. She's in Minnesota. Um, uh, I think there's one more in there that I coached. Um, the only thing I had any business coaching was wrestling. But I coached all those other things as well. And so loved football, loved coaching football and things like that. But there was something that I, I got caught up in that I see parents get caught up in. And I had to fight this in myself. And that is that when my kids played, um, I, 
I got really disappointed when they, they made a mistake. I, I could feel it in myself. I didn't ever show it. I tried not to show it. But I noticed all the parents around me too. And they felt really good if their kids were really good at the sport. But they felt, t- you could just tell there was a little distance between them and their kid that day if their kid just wasn't play- paying attention. Now I've told you before, like Jeremy, when he played soccer, he spent the whole time looking at his feet. He didn't look at the ball, he looked at his feet. And we'd say, there goes the ball by Jeremy. And we'd say, Jeremy, the ball's that way. So he would run that way. By the time he was running that way, the ball's going the other way. And she'd say, Jeremy, the ball's over there. And Jeremy never knew where the ball was because he was looking at his feet. You know what that was a sign of? That Jeremy had no interest in soccer. You know, that was a sign of that. Um, and you know what? Jeremy was never, ever, 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 ever going to go pro being a soccer you know, soccer player, right? And and so, but here's here's the one thing we can be ultra passionate about our kids in sports, and we can put a lot of weight on our kids in sports that they don't need to have. Can I hear an amen in here today? In fact, the thing that I love sports, and you know what sports are good for? Sports are good to teach our kids something about community. Something about purpose, something about uh, character, and something about what it means to be humble when you win, and what it means to also be humble when you lose. All things they need to know in life, right? Uh, But we treat it like that if my kid doesn't do well in this game, they're not going to get the corner office someday. They're going to be in the basement. And you know what? That's not the truth at all. In fact, some of the guys that some were all-stars on my kids' teams, I am old enough now to tell you that at the age of 30, I know of a couple of state high school wrestlers that are working at Denny's. Yeah. So I just want you to know... You can be passionate about sports, but it can't be ultimate passion. Because guess what? That won't burn. But it turn and tell the person next to you, that won't burn. That won't burn. All right, here's, here's another one. Here's, here's one that we use. This is going to fall all over the place. All right. Here's one that we use. Many times we think that our life will be settled if we are able to give or receive one of these. What is that? Wedding ring, yeah. That if on the day that I get married and find my Prince Charming or find my Snow White or whatever your dream is, um, then life begins. Then I can have some passion, right? Then life will begin and everything will be all right. All this stuff that I'm messing with, all this stuff in my life that is so hard will go away because I will have met my Prince Charming. You know where we get that? Disney. Yeah. And that's not a chapter in the Bible. It is not. Here's here's the thing. That if you don't have purpose in your life before you get married, you, you will bring that purposelessness into a marriage. And instead of bringing passion into the marriage, you will suck your marriage dry of passion. And I want you to ask any married person and say, how many problems did marriage solve for you? And they will probably say, in moments of honesty, zero. All the problems we had before are problems we have now. And in fact, now there are problems that we have to negotiate with someone else, which ends up turning into what? Arguments. So now sometimes those problems can become harder. Let me just tell you that if you're thinking your next relationship will solve your life, that won't burn. Would you say it with me? That won't burn, all right? We're, we're on a roll now. We're, we're cruising now. Well, here's what I want you to do. I want you to grab, go in your pocket or in your purse and grab your keys. Everybody get your keys out and rattle your keys for me, all right? 
Now, these keys, I don't know what they represent for you. These could represent your car. They could represent a house or something like that. Many of us think that once we attain certain things, once we get certain things, that's when our life is meaningful. That's when we've arrived, right? Uh, That's when we got it. How many of you have a dream car? Any dream car people out there? Way to go, Jessica. Jessica's the one on it. Uh, we've got some honesty back in here. All right. Jessica, what's your dream car? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, so I would probably go with a GTO or something like that. But that's all right. That's all right. If you want a fiberglass vehicle, that's okay. I mean, here's, here's the thing. We, we, all, we, we just go, man, I've arrived if, if I get that house. If I get that house with a little bit of property. The house a little bit of property in a real fireplace, you know, not this fake one, right? Can I just tell you that if something will burn physically, it will not burn spiritually. You understand what I'm talking about? And, And you know what? Those things lose their luster as soon as the mortgage comes. As soon as the payments hit, as soon as somebody hits your 67 whatever in the parking lot, as soon as, you know, the toilet clogs up in the new place and that kind of stuff, that won't burn. I got one more, one more. Put your keys back, by the way. Put your keys back. I don't want anybody leaving the keys in here today. Um, one more. And I don't know if you can see these, by the way. I have, can you see what these are? Can you tell what that is? Not a rat. A donkey. Can you tell what this is? That's an elephant. Why would I have a donkey and an elephant up here? Here's here's what I want to talk to you about this morning. Um, that I just I just want to want to tell you that I think people have their passions in the wrong places. And you know what? One of the biggest substitutes for passion for God is politics. Um, I know of more people that spend more time fussing about, yelling at the TV about, and investing their time in who's going to be the next leader of our country who do not spend that amount of time following after God. All right, now listen. Politics is not a bad thing. We need politics. We need power. But I want to tell you that the shape that our nation is in, where family members won't talk to each other because of politics where people are losing friends because of politics, where people lose friendships because of assumed politics, that's gone too far. And I want to tell you, I don't care if every policy you want to be passed, every law that you want to be passed gets passed, every person you want in the office gets gets elected, your government cannot save your soul, and it cannot give you an example of what it means to love other people. All right? And I want you to do this. I I understand the passion, but do not, for one minute, mistake anger at politics with true passion for life. Because guess what? That will burn, and it will burn in all the wrong ways. So, what's Elijah do? It's Elijah's turn now. And Elijah said uh, to all the people, come here to me. And they came to him. And he repaired the altar of the Lord, which has been torn down. And Elijah took 12 stones, one for each of the tribes descended from Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, your name shall be Israel. When the stone, with these stones, he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he dug a trench around it large enough to hold two seahs of seed, about three pounds uh, of seed each. Um, and he arranged the wood, cut the bowl into pieces, and laid it on the wood. 
And he said to them, fill four large jars with water and pour it on the offering and on the wood. And then he said, do it again. And they did it again. Do it a third time, he ordered them. And he did it a third time. The water ran down around the altar and even filled the trench. And at the time of the sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward and prayed, Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant and have done all these things at your command. Answer me, Lord. Answer me so that these people will know that you, Lord, are God. And that you are turning their hearts back again. What was revival? What was revival? Revival is when something becomes important again. When something is renewed again. Then the fire of the Lord fell. And it burned up the sacrifice. The wood. The stones. And the soil. It also licked up the water in the trench. And when all the people saw this, they fell prostrate. And cried, the Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. Can you picture that? Now, hey, did Elijah bring fire down? Not a trick question. Did Elijah bring fire down? No. Who brought fire down? God did. But Elijah had a part in this, didn't he? What was Elijah's part in this? He prayed, he arranged the altar, he he noticed that things were out of order, that the altar had to be rebuilt, that certain things had to be reprioritized, things had to be pulled back together again. It's okay to organize our lives, it's okay to have the right priorities, it's okay for us to do that, that won't bring the fire back, God's got to bring the fire back, but you know what? We need to do our part. He prays. He surrendered to God. He says, you've commanded me to do this. Don't just go out and do this. This is not God's command to you. And this is not God's command to me. But he says, says, God's commanded me to do this. And God's the one that brings the fire, right? But what he does is place the things around the fire. What he does is he straightens things up. He brings the 12 stones back. He builds the altar back. He makes it important again. Elijah has a part in this. For you and I, all of these things can be pretty good things. Sports has a good place. The next thing has a good place. Politics has a good place. Relationships have a good place. Work has a good place. Uh, Making money has a good place. Building a good name has a good place. But you know what it doesn't have is the ultimate place. It cannot have the ultimate place in your life and in my life if we want the fire of God in our lives. Because guess what? Those things won't burn. But what you can do is that if you want fire in those things, you want fire in your your relationship, you want God's fire in, in, in purity, in your politics, you want God's fire and purity in the way that you parent your children, you want God's fire and purity in the things that you do, in the work that you do, place them around the altar. Because guess what? God's fire is all consuming. And if you will place those things around the altar, near the altar, close to the altar, and arrange the altar as long as they are not the altar, because guess what? God's the one that decides what gets to be on the altar. God's the one that decides when the fire comes. And if you will bring those things in close and bring them close to God and allow him to prioritize them in the way that they need to go, then he will bring his fire to all of those things and he'll make sure that it looks the way he wants it to look when he's all done and the way it looks when he's all done is this in a way that tells other people the Lord he is God the Lord he is God not politics is not God not your job is not God not your financial situation is not God not your health it is not God not the next thing it is not God and none of those things will burn but guess what you're hungry for fire. You think you need water, but you're hungry for fire. 
And less, I, I think this, I think we're so desperate to buy into politics is because we kicked God out of our lives a long time ago and there is this gaping hole in our lives and politics fills it for a little while, right? Uh, here's what I think. I think so many of us are on to the next thing because we kicked God out of our lives a long time ago and there is a gaping hole in our lives and the next thing might fill it, but the next thing won't burn, folks. Only God. Only God can bring the fire. So where are you at this morning? Where are you at this morning? Are you willing to take the good things and release them for the better thing? Are you willing to take the good things and say, Lord, I'm going to place them close to your altar because I love these things so much that I don't want them to be in the wrong place so that they'll rule my life. And Lord... I want you to bring your fire on this. How many of you all, how many of you all have matured your way out of passion? How many of you all have matured your way out until all you care about is what other people think that you look like? All, of it, all, all you care about is your reputation. And so you don't want to be seen being too carried away with God. But Lord, guess, guess what? God wants your passion. What's your passion, folks? I hear every now and then old time Nazarenes talk about, do you remember the good old days when they used to run the aisles and wave their hankies and things like that? Now, I got to admit, that's a little bit weird. It's a little bit weird. I've seen it happen. I, uh, how many of you have heard about people that used to run the backs of pews? I heard a story one time of somebody that used to run the backs of pews. They get the, the, the glory of the Holy Ghost would get on them and they'd run the backs of pews. And I thought, in the church that won't let me run down the hall or walk down the hall too fast, somebody was on the backs of the pews, running the backs of the pews. Here's, here's, I, I don't think we've got to get weird. But you know what? If God wants weird from me, I'm, I'm willing to do it. I, I don't think we've got to get awkward. But you know what? If God wants awkward from me, I think I'll do it. I've been in plenty of situations where I've followed God's lead and I felt awfully awkward and God used it in a powerful way. Where are you at this morning? Where are you at this morning? What you're clinging to, will that burn? Will that burn? Hey, worship team, would you come? Let's bow our heads for a moment. Where are you at on the whole scale of passion with God? Where you at? You know what? Maybe right now you're feeling like, I don't know. The wood in my life, my life is pretty wet. <laughs> Not sure God can even light this wood. I don't know. We just read a passage that pretty much tells us God is a wet wood fire lighter. Yeah. Where you at with passion? I don't know if God is speaking to you right now, but if, if he's tugging at your heart and he's saying, you know, there used to be a fire in there. Let me stoke that fire. Let me, let me put a real fire in there because you've just been surviving on fake fire. You've been surviving on the videotape of somebody else's fire. And God doesn't want that. He wants a fire in you. So this morning, let's just bow our heads, please. Bow our heads. You just, you just want God's fire. <laughs> Whatever that looks like in your life. Just raise your hand. Just want God's fire. Whatever that looks like right now. All you want is for God to have his way and to do his thing and to make it right through you and, and, uh, and, and have passion. You want passion for God. You don't want to just go through the motions. But Lord, this morning, we just pray that you would bring your fire down on us. Lord, whatever in our life needs to burn up, needs to burn up. Whatever in our life should stay, should stay. But Lord, we know this. That all of these things can't be on the altar of our life because only you can be on the altar of our life. Lord, you are the one that will bring passion for us. 
And so this morning, we bow before you and are humble before you and pray that your spirit would move among us and cleanse us in a way that brings pure love and passion for our God. May we serve you heart, soul, mind, and strength today. For you are our God. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand with me. Stand and let's worship together.